Hey, PT on Ice. Happy Monday. It is 10.45 on the 29th, uh, October 29th, almost the end of October. And uh, and I am Mike Eisenhart here to check in with you today a little bit still to, till the morning. Um, you know, unfortunately, I missed my typical 8.30 slot time today. Uh, hopefully, anybody who was looking for that saw that um, I hit some pretty gnarly traffic on the way into my first meeting. So that kind of threw off the day. Um, but uh, but he, we're here now. It's uh, it's 10:45 and ready to rock and roll. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the timer and uh, and we'll get this thing going. So um, I thought today what I wanted to talk about uh, it's you know as as usual it's kind of uh, lots of little pieces and things that have come together. Uh, some of it over the weekend, some of it in the last week. But what I really wanted to talk about is why I think a move group is maybe one of the simplest most effective tactics that any of us have that we can implement anywhere, anytime, um, and, uh, and, and make a, make a meaningful difference in the health of the populations that we serve. Um, and ultimately what I mean by that, a move group, um, as goofy as that might sound, um, it, it's exactly like it sounds like a group of people who come together, um, to move, um, and, and to do so in a way that they enjoy being around each other, but to do so in a group. Now, let me give you some, some context. Why, um, why this stuck in my head, right? So uh, first and foremost, this past weekend um, on Saturday, uh, I've been heading out to our West facility, which is like a new little satellite that we opened recently to just try to get a lift in. It's a nice little place. Um, and, and some of our trainers uh, have, have really put some love into it and turned it into a cool little environment for, for strength training in particular, um, something that I probably should do more, more of. And so um, I decided to pack my kids up and head out there. It takes about maybe 15, 20 minutes to get there from my house. And, uh, and we, we got there and, and showed up, and lo and behold, there are two of our folks there already training. So it was kind of like this impromptu move group, um, and, and it was kind of neat. Uh, on the flip side, I then saw on Facebook someone had posted something, uh, and, and Aaron's picture, Aaron Perez's picture was in it, and it was like um, the local uh, uh, running club that runs out of our base camp facility every Saturday morning, and there was Aaron with a couple of like, you know, maybe five other people who had showed up to brave the weather, and, uh, and he was heading out uh, to go for a run with that particular move group. And then I started to reflect back a little bit on some of the um, things that I had recently seen, uh, and, and one that was very new and one that was actually not new. And it, it started to kind of solidify this concept for me, right? So first, um, you know, let's talk about something that's very recent. I posted recently on Twitter um, a, a study that came out from the Journal of the American Medical Association, and um, they were uh, talking about um, cardiorespiratory fitness, which of course is a topic that, that I like. I, I think it's one of the simplest, um, most straightforward, modifiable risks that we see every day. And whether or not you um, actively try to do something about it um, or whether or not you just kind of like know it's there, uh, it's huge. So this particular study was 120 something thousand people that they looked at. And ultimately what they found was these were uh, people who as they aged had, had done fitness testing and they found that it was a, a very strong predictor of you know quality of life and longevity. And what was really cool about it was that their findings were there's no real top end. Um, it didn't seem to like plateau out. Like the, the fitter people got, um, the better it got for them. So that of course to me is always something I love to see, right? Big, big sample size of people, um, you know, simply looking at fitness and, and longevity and fitness and, and quality of life. So of course, something that um, I, I wanted to make sure that I jumped on. Then the second thing was, was some evidence that's, that's older. I think it's like a 1995 study maybe or something. I can find it and post it in there. But I first heard about it in a, in a book I've been kind of flipping through. And this one I thought was cool because it really hit on the group side of this, right? Um, and so this particular guy uh, was looking at predictors of mortality after heart surgery. Um, and what he what he found was that there were five, well, he and his group found there were five variables that really stood out. Now, some of them are ones that we wouldn't surprise, you know, wouldn't surprise anybody, like having a previous cardiac surgery. So if someone who had had a previous cardiac surgery, they were much more likely to die within the six months after this current cardiac surgery. So, so maybe no surprise there. Um, another one that kind of hits close to home for, for traditional PTs. Um, someone who had really poor ADL status, right? Again, had a much higher likelihood of not surviving a heart surgery. So again, maybe no surprises there. Um, 
then there were two at the bottom that I thought were 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 real interesting, and and I think they're real interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, one because they they really put connect where it belongs, which is right alongside those biomedical risks. Uh, oh, I think the third one was age. If you're older than seventy and you had a a heart surgery, you were much less likely to survive from it. Um, but but then the two at the bottom that I really thought were cool. The first one is. Do you have group a group of people in your life, right? Like, do you participate in groups? To me, this this really stood out, right? Because it, it really kind of shows us the whole social dynamic piece, how important that is, and what a big influence it was. And it was substantial. It was like three times or four times as likely to die in the six months after a cardiac surgery if you don't or didn't participate in groups. Like, if you don't have your little group of people who you kind of like are with, you know, your people, whatever that is, your tribe. And so there was a real meaningful number there uh, in people who had their tribe. And then the last one was, do you have um, regular uh, involvement in some kind of religious or faith activity? Again, kind of like that that nourishment of the spirit. Now, it didn't talk about any one faith uh, versus another. It was just simply, do you participate? Do you have a, a belief system that puts you into that particular setting on a regular basis? And do you kind of have trust in a higher power? Um, and so kind of the spiritual side of health that no one really likes to talk much about because it feels like we're touching religion, which which is really not the point of his study. He's sim- simply looking at belief systems and kind of where people put their, their faith. And so both of those were big. And so, whereas I don't think that that, um, that that I'm necessarily qualified to talk about why those things do what they do or why they have an impact, I think we, we can just get to the conclusion of they have an impact. And it's substantial, right? Like three and four times the likelihood of dying six months after, even after they've ruled out those other variables that are more biomedical uh, in nature. And so, to me, it kind of like gets us to this idea of, it, it's sort of like, you know, um, like, like gives you something for your essence, whoever you are, your being, your, your spirit, like whatever you want to talk about, whatever what label you want to put on that, like the essence of us all needs to be fed just like our muscles need to be fed and our, our organs need to be fed and our, you know, connective tissue and all that other stuff. Like we need to feed that with stimulus of some kind. And if we stimulate that, um, and then let it recover, we are stronger in the process. And so to me, you know, as sort of thinking, putting on like my, okay, like if I'm a traditional therapist in practice, how can I take what we know, such as things like this, that cardiorespiratory fitness is massive when it comes to shifting people's uh, quality of life and long-term health. And and so in at scale, in, at number, it is a major population health intervention area, right? Like if we just simply measured it. Now I've talked about this in the past and, 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 you know, anywhere I go, you know, people say like, what's one thing you could do, um, in the clinic. I always say like, you can measure CRF, like anybody can do this on any number of tests. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, shout out to Allie. I see she's on, she's going to be talking about some of this in her course, uh, that's kicking off around the new year. So, so if that's something you want to learn more about, you should go that, that route. Um, and, uh, and, and get involved in that kind of side of the world because that is a simple tactic that anybody who's qualified and all PTs are um, to test, measure, and monitor that can make a major impact on the future trajectory of health. So that's one of them. The other one is the energy that we draw from being around other people, that we are built for this, that, that we're like, it's a requirement. And, and studies like the one that I, I was referring to show that very clearly that when we stress and worry and and are alone, that that has a negative impact on our health. And when you can kind of kiss that off a little bit, and maybe that's through your faith, or maybe that's through the other people around you, when you can share uh, and let other people carry the load or other um, you know beings or higher power or however you want to define that, carry that load for you, um, that has a major implication on your health. And we can't ignore that. I think that's one of the things that really uh, sits with me is that we, we, you know, that's like a messy area. So we don't want to touch it. Like we, uh, you know, I don't know. That's like, I feel like that's a little outside of the scope of being a professional. And I look at that and I say to myself, well, no, no way. Like it, it can't, you, you don't get that out. You don't get to say it's outside of my scope as a professional. If your job is to make sure that people are living the best version of themselves over the life course, and we know that that does help them do so, then you must uh, at least touch that. And, and that might be just as simple as saying, hey, I recognize it for what it is and I ask someone about it. And that was it. They had two simple questions on this interview, 
right? Like that they found to be substantial. Like, you know, do you regularly participate in some kind of faith-based activity? And do you have regular participation in groups? And so for me, one of the tactics, one of the things that any of us can do anywhere, anytime, um, is to start a move group. You know, and, and again, hats off to Allie on this. I mean, that's exactly what she did. You know, I mean, so, so, so here she goes out to this major horse show and I know nothing about like how these whole things work, but the place looked ridiculously huge. Like, like that is a population of people. Talk about going where the people are. Like, that's your people. Now, she happens to have a great knowledge of this particular sport and this particular set of folks. So understands kind of the cultural undertones there, which is huge. And what does that do? It allows you to begin to br- you sort of bring things that are necessary to, to create bridges to health. Now, um, it doesn't have to be straight up, I'm here to help you with your health. It could be, I'm here to help you with your performance. And we know, of course, that in any realm, your health is going to predict your performance. Like, we get all of that. And so, to me, like, starting a move group is about as easy of a tactic that anybody can do anywhere. And we can support them. It doesn't necessarily have to be us that starts this. They're probably already started. You know, I mean, like, that running club that runs out of base camp, I mean, they've been doing that for a long time. But having kind of a connection to that group allows us to get into that space with them. And I think that that's really, really big. Um, And I think that we can do more of it. And so I guess I would just kind of look back and say, you know, here's the little method to the madness moment, you know, on our Monday with Pop. A little method to the madness moment is that's exactly what we tried to do with Summer of Move. So you can understand, of course, how excited I was this week when I was forwarded an email from someone who is doing this in their PT clinic. Right? Like we did it with our staff. It went really, really well. We're going to do a year of move starting in January. We'd love for the, you know, the Free the Oak team to help us as far as a system. You know, hats off, Michelle. I mean, that's awesome. I can't wait to have that conversation today. Like she totally saw the value in getting groups of people connected around movement. And what did that do? People got, you know, the email says people got stronger and people were rapping and having fun. And oh my gosh. And guess what? Was it therapeutic? Yes. Was it therapy? Not by traditional standards. But it was therapeutic. You can be sure that that staff felt better, felt more connected. You know, so so fast forward a little bit more to today. I don't know if I'll make it today, but our group um, has started doing this. And and it's it's a little more grueling, but they've started this kind of like um, staff lift, right? Like the team gets together on Mondays and they do at least one lift together as a group. Yeah, the people who do it will definitely get stronger and fitter. But the bigger part of that, of course, is that the connection amongst those people while moving. Can a walking program make a major difference in someone's life? Yes, you better believe it. Because if it gives them a chance to vent and complain about whatever it is that's going on in their life and help solve that and work that through with another person, we know that has a positive impact on health. And so that, that's my challenge for this week. You know, in my two minutes left, it's to ask yourself, who is in your move group? And if you don't have one, find one as a therapist. If you need one, I mean, look, again, method of the madness moment, that's rising tide, folks. I mean, the rising tide, you know, initiative, experience, retreat, like whatever you want to call it. We had a little hard time deciding what to call it, but that's what it is. It's getting people together centrally, you know, kind of connected so that you can build deeper relationships and sort of share the burden of of all of the day-to-day life stuff while moving (laughs) because it's that much stronger. It's that much more powerful when we're doing it that way. So yeah, we can move with people in isolation. We call that therapy many times. Or we can think about how we bridge it and make it just part of being. Because when it's part of being, it's a major, major thing. Now, I'm not qualified to to talk about this next part, and so I'm just simply going to say this. We know that faith and, and, and a trust in a higher power has health benefits. This particular study showed it. There are plenty of other things that show that when you nourish your spirit, there's some value there. We know that. And so I'm just going to sort of say this, and, and I'm going to try to hold it together um, because like, I don't really know where, where, like how to put it into words. But the stuff that we are seeing in this world, including the absolute atrocity that happened over the weekend in Pittsburgh, If that doesn't tell us that we need to connect as people, we need to reach out 
to whoever we can and connect as people. And if we can have, have a role in that, if we can play a little role in that, regardless of who those people are, we can maybe make a difference. Now, I, I have no idea. You know, someone texted me this morning and said, hey, man, like, maybe you got a platform. Maybe you can say something there. And, and, and I'm not qualified to talk about that. And it's way, way out of my realm of understanding. But I got to tell you, if, they, if you believe at some level that there is health in all policies and health in all situations, then we have to believe that health could maybe have made some kind of a difference. Maybe. I don't know. I hope. Bottom line is this. We know that we can make an impact in the lives of the people that we serve. Who's in your move group? Start there. It doesn't take much. It takes consistency. And it takes a willingness to say, hey, movement is a window into your future health. I think I can help with that. Come join my move group. You're welcome here. Time's up. It's only Monday. Just getting started. I just left a great meeting with a, a fairly large group. They're getting it. They're getting it, people. It's happening. I mean, people are starting to connect the dots. What we know is this. We got to get to work. We got to start where we can. We got to go where the people are. And we got to slow.